Welcome to Life Bursts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. And today, an invitation to a much bigger story. Stay tuned. Yes, welcome to Life Bursts with Matt and Sarah. Today, we are chatting with John. Thank you, John, for coming in on today's show. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's start with our first question that we ask all of our guests. Where did life start out for you, John? Well, that's a good question. I've been thinking about that. And what I discovered was my life started in Germany okay. in 1858. Okay. Mm. Wow. You're looking very uh, good. I'm looking, I'm looking good for 170 <laughs> years, aren't I? Yes. So what happened in 1858 was a group of uh, religious fanatics, mm. uh, Wendish people who migrated because of religious persecution and the famine came to South Australia in 1858. So I'm a German Lucas. And so that, because I begin to wonder as I found out a bit about my history, why did I end up like I am? Okay. And in, in, this, in the work that I do and everything like that. And I, and I began to understand that way back then, even though I had no history of church, no history of Christianity in many ways, back then, there was a root there that was uh, a little shoot that was started to form right back then. And so they came to, to Gawler River and uh, we found a little bit more about it also. Uh, there were about seven brothers and sisters that came out mm -hmm. to it all, which is really exciting. And so uh, my grandfather, um, he was a very talented man. He uh, made a fortune and lost it. He made a fortune with uh, inventions for agriculture, mm -hmm. but then the 1930s depression came along and uh, he lost everything. Mm. Now, the other interesting thing about my family was that uh, he married the daughter of a Greek sea captain. Mm. And so, in other words, my grandmother was Greek okay. and my father, my grandfather had German roots. Now, that became really obvious to me as I looked at my grandmother, who was short and dumpy, little Greek lady. <laughs> And I wondered, why am I short and dumpy like a little Greek person? <laughs> why did I get that? Why did I look like that? And she was a fantastic lady because, you see, through the Depression, uh, my grandfather became depressed, I imagine. And she was a very talented businesswoman. So what she did was to uh, hire out large homes at Glenelg and became a boarder. So she boarded people and made an income by boarding people from Holidays, Broken Hill, all of that through there. Mm. So that was really exciting. And then they had five children. And uh, the good news is uh, the youngest was my dad, who was a spoiled one, I was told by his <laughs> sisters. And my dad was a very talented man. Uh, he was a sportsman. So basically he swam for Australia in the Commonwealth Games back in 1938 in Sydney. Now I said, well, Dad, where is your uniform? Did you, no, Grandma threw it away. Yeah. Oh, no, I said. Yeah. Oh. So my dad was a very talented sportsman. Yeah, well. Water was his first love. Mm. So he not only swam, but he was a diver. And so he even judged diving for a state level and national level for 30 years. He was also a cricketer. He played golf, everything like that. Everything he did, he was good at. And he ended up playing league football for Glenelg. And so that's what happened. And so that sporting aspect was very much inlaid in me. Mm. I'm not a great sportsman, but I love sport. I love watching sport. And I've discovered, why did I do that? And it really comes back to my father and his mm. involvement. He also went to World War II, which was really quite a dramatic time. He was a ratter to Brook. Oh. So he's, he was in Palestine, mm. in the desert, fought in Rommel. He was a signalman. And uh, his job was to lay out the lines and then memorise Morse code and send Morse code through the signals of all of this. And so it was really quite dangerous work going under there to do that. And uh, so um, he tells me one story. What happens was that he uh, was driving back and this guy wanted to ride back. And they were driving back and all these machine guns were just going, bullets going straight over him. And... Uh, and so he got up, and the guy that they pulled up, gave a ride home, jumped off. And they were really worried. But the day later at the camp, they saw him, saw them and says, what happened to you? Did you get hit? No, I got scared. You were too dangerous going out through there. <laughs> so, so then he went from there into Kokoda Trail. Mm. And he was on the Kokoda Trail with Diver Derek. And Diver Derek on the VC. Mm. So, and so, so that's yeah. all the war, 
all of that. So I've, I have an affinity to the return services, mm. affinity to, to, to going and, and seeing what happens and all of that there. Wow. So that's my dad's side of it all. And then, then my mother mm -hmm. was totally different. Okay. Mother was Irish and, and the thing. Don't do your, um, don't, go, don't sort out your grandmother's funeral because you find out there's a few skeletons in the cupboard. Okay. Huh. She was married five times. I couldn't believe it. Five times. And unfortunately, my mum came from a broken family. In other words, uh, her dad was alcoholic, kicked her out, and they kicked him out. And so she really had not many, fa uh, many fathers mm -hmm. and didn't understand what family. So here's my dad, Greek background, big families, yeah. all of that. That's their nature and DNA. And mother, who didn't know what family looked like. Mm. And so what happened is that they met uh, at Myers. Uh, he was 32 and she was 21. Gorgeous lady, but uh, underneath it all, low self-esteem. Mm. She had a red hair, she had a bit of a temper. So yeah. all of this was part of my DNA. Of, on the one side, my dad with the sporting, didn't like conflict but like big family, my mum, who is low self-esteem, felt rejected, uh, all of those issues there. And so when it came to family gatherings for, for my family, mum would stay home mm. and dad would take us to the family gatherings. Mm. And so it was really a, a quite a, a strange going, get up going there. Did your mother ever like explain to you why she doesn't go or any of this? Or how did you find all of this out? Well, we, uh, basically in terms of, uh, it was obvious that she didn't go because she didn't go. Yeah. She was just stayed home. Yeah, yeah. And it was only as you, you get older and you reflect upon it that you just, you put the jigsaw puzzle to pieces and yeah. to do that. And you discover that why that was the case. She was, um, so she was the youngest of two girls, mm -hmm. but she didn't really get on, the two sisters didn't get on very well at all. So, so we had... Broken family on one side, big family on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so they were formed together. So then I grew up in the post-World War II, and guess what? Mum and Dad worked hard. Dad was a floor-covering contractor, uh, so he laid lino and carpets and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Mum helped him, did the books, and was out there doing all the hard work with him as well. And, uh, and so guess what? I was the eldest of the mm -hmm. three. Mum had uh, a lot of trouble getting pregnant, a lot of miscarriages. Apparently, I was one of two, but my twin got lost somewhere in the okay. thing. And my brother and sister were twins. And so mum was dealing with three children 18 months apart growing up. So that was a big learning That's curve a big, for her yes. too. So that was what was happening. So we grew up and uh, in, a, in a time when we had to look after ourselves. Mum and dad was working. I would come home, cook the tea, all of that to, mm. to, to get. So a lot of independence. Uh, a lot of struggle, but it was, you look back and it was a good life. It was a good life. At the time, though, what did you think? Oh, at the time, I hated golf. Mum and Dad were golfers. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, because golf took them away. You see, until, on Saturdays, they played golf together. It was really, my mum became a, a state golfer. She was really mm -hmm. good. But, of course, that gave her esteem and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But it meant from a family point of view, they worked hard. Then on Saturdays, we would look after ourselves, but mum and dad were playing golf in the afternoon. I'd take my brother and sister. We were, either went down to Glenelg to grandma's. We went and saw a movie and then went to grandma's place to be picked up. And then on Sunday mornings, mum and dad played golf and we were out in the sand hills for three hours by ourselves, entertaining ourselves while they were playing golf at Westwood Ho. And so um, while I appreciate golf, uh, and, and not a good golfer, but it, there was that deep down this resentment that, you know, all of that we were held to look after ourselves and to do everything like that. And it became really, really a challenge in that sense. Yeah. And, of course, three siblings growing up, um, we just had as many fights as we had looking after each other. So I'm sure you did. It was different. Yes. Well, we will be back with more of John's story straight after this on Life Best with Matt and Sarah. Welcome back to Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We're chatting to John. And John, you've given us a good background of your, mm. your family life. Emily. Not everyone takes us back that far, no, but don't. it's helped, uh, as you've explained, to, yes. to shape you who you are today. Yeah. Take us back to your childhood and, uh, yeah, those, those early years. Well, I, I grew up at Glenelg and uh, I, 
I was different to most of my family because I was academic. A lot of people were very business people, mm -hmm. but I was not a business people. So at the primary school, I went to Glenelg Primary School, and I was quite a, an academic. Uh, I was in the top five at that time, and that looked really good. And that built my self-esteem and feeling good about myself. Mm -hmm. Played a bit of sport at the primary school. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Brighton High School, and I was in the A stream, and uh, that worked out really well. Uh, and uh, so I had to learn French and Latin and all of those languages as well. Um, but in all both primary school and, and high school, it was really a struggle to find a place of belonging. You know, you okay. look for groups that you belong to. Mm -hmm. I was given a nickname because of my short stature and, and fat appearance that I was uh, Humphrey, and so they called me oh, Humphrey. That's so nice. that is, uh, uh, and I was the Humph, and that, so that became a, a label, if you like, and yeah. of it all. Uh, I like music and dancing, and so uh, we had uh, dancing classes, but again, we had socials, and so whenever I asked a girl to dance, she politely said no. So that reinforced mm. my feelings about myself and everything mm. like that. Mm. So it was really, really, really a uh, struggle in that sense of identity and what we're doing. Mm. Uh, things changed politically. And what happened was that Gough Whitlam, the Labor Party, came in. It meant that uh, university was free. And so my goal of, of able to be a teacher that I wanted to be in year five, I wanted to be a teacher, a maths teacher. Okay. That, that was the, the, the goal. Yeah. Uh, and the opportunity to do that. So even though I only got straight C's of matriculation, I got into Flinder, at Flinders uh, University and uh, that became uh, an important uh, place for me. Mm. But I was young. I was only 17 when I went to university. I was, my birthday was right at the beginning of the year. Okay. And so I was always the youngest in the class. And so... I was able to drive at 16 and during my trick, but 17 changed things for me. What happened was my brother invited me to go to church. Now, my brother was not a church. He found out that there were some good-looking girls uh -huh. at this little church, as you do, mm -hmm. and it was a Sunday night service. <laughs> and so my mother had just come back from Sydney, and uh, she brought back one of those laughing boxes where you press the button, <laughs> came out. Oh, so we thought we'd put it into our pocket oh, and go to church because it was a coffee lounge afterwards and uh, and everything like that. Well, we struck a lay preacher. And I'm like, this is nothing against lay preachers, but 45 minutes and he was still going. <laughs> and, you know, these are two guys who've never been to church before, wooden pews, it's cold, and you wriggle one more time and off it went. The laughing box went off. <laughs> the girls in front of us uh, were... Uh, trying to hold back the laughter, <laughs> the the whole service, he, he stopped the whole service. And then as, as we were leaving, he pointed, looked at me and he said, Satan sent you to stop oh. this service. Oh, goodness. Well, goodness me. so that was a bit of a thing. But you see, even though that was the case, um, the people saw the funny side of it all, were thankful that the service stopped because they were getting a bit bored by the girl <laughs> and they invited us to do that. And uh, so we went to the coffee lounge and out of their love and their invitation, I came back. And I came back uh, a couple of Sundays later. And there, right sitting in that pew, I heard God speak to me. Okay, I have to ask, did you take the laughing box with you again or did you learn? No. no. Okay. okay, you learned. I learned. <laughs> you learned. But I was labelled. Yeah, yeah. I was labelled. But anyway, oh. <laughs> uh, and what I heard was God speak to me okay. and he said he loved me. And it's not that it wasn't an audible voice, but it was really a sense of a strong inner voice saying that he loved me. And and there is a sense of not only just loving me, but inviting me to join him. That, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, John. Like, so you didn't hear a voice in your head. You just felt something? Like what? It, it, was, it was a feeling. A feeling. But it was okay. also uh, the words... So it wasn't an audible voice outside me, okay. but it was something inside of me okay. that was connected to me that I heard. Okay. And that he said, I love you, okay. which is, you know, just like transforming. Yeah, it sounds like it. And then the invitation started. I started to go to church. I loved the Bible and I really wanted to get in and explain the Bible to people. So they invited me to... Uh, to take services and be part of the, the, the youth service and things like that. But we had a problem. I was young 
I was a Christian, 18, 19, and I asked too many questions. And when you're in church and you ask too many questions about things like that, uh, that are quite curly questions, um, and they struggle to answer because you're supposed to believe literally what it says. You're not supposed to ask questions. It became a difficulty. Mm. And so, uh, and then I, there was some murmuring with the youth and I tried to be a voice for that. And it became obvious that my time at that church uh, needs to change, which is a bit sad, but we have strong feelings of it all. So my friend invited me to Adelaide to Mourn Church. And that was a totally different thing, an evening service, mainly people of our own age, single people, people who struggle. And they did a contemporary worship. And uh, and part of that is they invited me to take leadership in that. And the end was running that um, at Bourne Church. And it was an amazing experience. And it really formed where I, what I got myself in because, you see, uh, the people who came weren't the recognised people. They were the least, the lost, the last of the community. We had one group we called the Four Musketeers. They were four, four gentlemen. Some were deaf, others couldn't speak. And this Keith was a very tall man. And uh, unfortunately, he liked methylated spirits too much. So when he spoke to you, he was up there, right? And the gas is coming right off of him. Mm. So, but it was amazing because... He came back a, a year or so later. He was there all the time. Mm -hmm. And he came back a year later. There was no methylated spirits. And he showed me the pictures. He took these other three guys on the bus to the Gold Coast and showed them all around the Gold Coast and brought them back again. And that, and that, that sort of just touched my heart. Here's a guy who people didn't, would write off. Mm -hmm. And yet he had something in him. God somehow changed him took him off the methylated spirits and gave him the capacity to look after these three other guys. Mm. And they were like brothers together. That's what we call them, the Four Musketeers. Mm, yeah. and, and that was really exciting in that mm, way. Mm. It, was a, it was an invitation that was there. I met my wife there at uh, Mourn Church. And it was a time when the Uniting Church was being formed. And so uh, it was a time of exploration. Back at the Baptist Church, meanwhile, back at the Baptist Church earlier on, I went on to a... Um, church exchanged to Dandenong Baptist and that's when I felt the call of the spirit through the preaching to think about being a minister okay but my problem is I'm trained to be a teacher mm -hmm. and I still got study to do mm -hmm. what do I do do I toss everything in because I also run a Commonwealth scholarship so I was committed to the Commonwealth for three years to yeah. teach yeah. so I decided to complete the, uh, the teaching mm -hmm. and to worry about that fall afterwards mm. right okay so you met your wife this is my question that i always yeah. ask <laughs> as you know because you watch show you met at church but how did it happen how did it unfold oh that was interesting we met at a uh, new year's eve party okay. january new year's eve party i was there with a friend of mine who was a doctor and we were talking about eyeing off this young girl. She looked really good. She'd just come back and she looked very beautiful and everything. He was slow as a wet week, you know. He was, it didn't really bother us. So I said, mm. so basically um, we, I invited her to take her home. And uh, it was a bit rocky because she was not impressed that in a week's time I was going to leave and take two girls to Queensland on a holiday to take them back to parents and things like that. And so after the initial... Uh, fling, as they say, mm. I was dropped like a hot potato. But however, I was determined, we came back <laughs> and uh, March we reconnected. And, uh, and so uh, we uh, fell in love and uh, which was really good. We were going to, uh, going to Godfrey's on Port Road and um, the carpet, uh, the, the oh, carpets for, white, for, for everything like that, just to look at, <laughs> as you do to look at cupboards and things like that. And so, and so I went to the toilet and, uh, as, and, I, and I sat at the toilet there and I says, God, is this the girl for me? Right, in the toilet of a car. So, so it was a, a, a little bit question. I didn't hear any audible voice, but I opened the door and there was this huge sign, Elizabeth, there, which is her name. <laughs> and I thought it was a sign. a sign. Later I realised that is all the goods going to Elizabeth. <laughs> and that's why Elizabeth was there. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw it as a sign from God that uh, 
Elizabeth was the one to be. Oh, lovely. Well, we're going to come back and hear more of John's story straight after this on Life Bursts with Matt and Sarah. Welcome back to Life Bursts here with Matt and Sarah. Today we are chatting with John. We just heard the hilarious story about how he met his wife and that he walked out of the toilet after asking God for a sign whether you should marry your wife and you walked out and the sign was a literal sign that said Elizabeth, which was her name. So you obviously married her. I did. You did. <laughs> so she was doing a midwifery <laughs> course. And so we met in January. We were engaged in September and the following January yeah. uh, we were married Lovely. at Mon Church. And uh, so it was really quite quick. Um, her dad was worried because it was so quick he thought she was pregnant, but that wasn't the case. Right. Uh, he was really happy because his previous uh, daughters married students and I was a teacher. So ah. he was happy about that. <laughs> then he discovered that in that the uh, first year of marriage, I decided to become a student again. And so that's when I, ent I applied to be a minister in the Uniting Church, okay. went to the um, whole... Uh, examination process and was accepted and so we started uh, in 1978 uh, doing four years at the uh, Park and Wesley College. Uh, it was, uh, I talked, I, I was going out with other girls beforehand and talked about being a minister and everything like that and they weren't really interested in that sort of idea and so that's why we didn't have that relationship. So I didn't talk much about it to my wife, Liz. So when, when I mentioned her that I was going to think about entering the ministry, sure, sure, she said, yeah, it was okay. Uh, not thinking that anything was going to happen. It was going to take a few years. Well, I went on to the, uh, the weekend in October and was accepted. And all of a sudden, uh, school was finished and uh, we started college. Right. She was a midwife doing work and I was a student again. <laughs> And so we worked hard for four years at Park and Wesley College. I did a Bachelor of Divinity because uh, a lot which from Melbourne, uh, which turned out to be the best thing uh, about it all. Uh, for, and I'll let fly about that a bit sooner. So we did four years and everything was good. We had a baby, uh, Naomi, uh, and uh, so we were looking forward to our first appointment at Meningi. I'd always hoped that I was going to be a lecturer, you know, and I want to be a teacher, a lecturer, yes, yeah, okay? Yeah. And so the whole idea of a Bachelor of Divinity was the first step in getting some academic qualification. Okay. So back, so we were down at Meningi, we were appointed to Meningi. Uh, that was a, a great place. Uh, we lived at Meningi and all the churches were 50 k's away that I looked after. I did 40,000 k's in a mm. year. So I looked after Coomandook, Canalpin, Narung, uh, Malalong, uh, all of those places mm -hmm. in there. And there are a whole lot of stories there of hitting kangaroos, uh, turning my car over on the first Good Friday service and not showing up to the final mm. Good Friday service. Yeah, yeah. All of those things were there, but it was a really great time uh, there. And uh, it was a very special time. Yeah. But then I found out in 1986, in my final year, that uh, a doctoral ministry program was being started at the Bible College in South Australia. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that uh, Peter Wagner came with uh, Eddie Gibbs and I started uh, that course thinking that I'll do a doctorate of ministry and that will provide the academic qualifications to be a lecturer. Well, two things happened there. Firstly, uh, Dr. Wagner always asked someone to pray and he said to, to people, um, I'm going to pray about it and Lord will show me the person I'll invite to pray to begin the the sessions. Okay. And so one day I was listening and what happened was that the guy behind me and others says, I know who um, know who got, uh, Wagner is going to ask. And he, the other, his mate said, how do you know? Well, I asked God and he told me. <laughs> and so, uh, so it blow me down. He said, this is the name. And then Dr. Wagner came out and says, I like X to do it. And he was spot on. And that really rocked my boat that actually yeah. God can talk. Okay. And talks to people. Okay. Okay. And that became a, a, a desire within me. You know, if he can talk to in the Bible, if he talked to this guy, why can't he talk to me? Mm, good question. The other thing that happened to me was uh, during the breaks, Dr. Wagner uh, prayed for people's backs, and so he. So I'm curious. You know, I like seeing what this is. I was not interested, but I was just curious. Okay. So I stood there, 
And uh, he was praying for the back. And all of a sudden, something happened to me. Uh, what we recognized that the Holy Spirit came upon me and I started feeling giddy and I started feeling a bit strange in myself. Yeah. And I just fobbed it off. It must have been the food they ate, you know, though, as you do that. Okay. But then I was walking down for lunch uh, down Arnley Road and it blew me down and it happened again. And I, I felt like I was a drunken sailor walking down Arnley Road. And so uh, it was amazing time. And I went to Dr. Wagner and he said, What's going on? I says, I explained to him. He said, well, yeah. that's the Holy Spirit. So that's the next invitation that I got from God. Okay. So am I going to be a lecturer or am I going to do what God wants me to do? And it turned out to be in his healing ministry. Okay. So uh, that was there. So we got an invitation to go to Peterborough. Peterborough at that time was nicknamed Hell. It was a railway town uh, and it was nine years but a difficult time. Uh, but a great time at the same time. I was appointed as a joint Anglican and Uniting Church minister. Mm -hmm. So I started off with the Anglican Church and two things happened in the Anglican Church, not the Uniting Church, the Anglican Church. Okay. One is um, we were running a, uh, a ladies group and we're praying and all of a sudden a male voice came out of this lady and says, she's mine, you're not going to have her. And I said, far out. They didn't train me for this at college. What's going on here? Okay. And so what I discovered was that this was a demonic spirit speaking th as a male voice through this lady. How is something like that allowed to do that? Well, I, I think God allowed that for me. Yeah. Not, okay. uh, certainly the lady didn't want it and she needed ministry and she needed help. And so all of a sudden I was invited to think about Satan and demons and, and if people are being caught up like that, how do you set them free? So how did you set her free? Well, I didn't do a very good job. Oh, okay. I prayed my little heart out initially and then uh, I said, well, I promised myself I wouldn't get caught short again. So I had to do a lot of reading and understanding to work out how am I going to help people like that. The other thing that happened to me was, again, in the Anglican Church. In the Anglican Church, it was, it was pretty cold there in wintertime in Peterborough. And mm -hmm. so they have a set order of service. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a scripture verse to start off uh, the services and everything like that. So mm -hmm. the scripture service for the day was from Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, plans that give you hope or a future. And I started reading it out. And it was just right. All of a sudden, I did hear the audible voice of God saying that to me, that even as I was reading it, they were hearing my voice, but I was hearing God's voice. In your head or heart or? Everywhere. Every, okay. And so much so, it just rocked my boat. Mm -hmm. And I really had to get my life together because I had to take a service. And here is God sort of challenging me to say that I have a plan for you. And, and he didn't expand exactly what that plan was, but all of a sudden, he was inviting me to enter his plan. And so all of that nine years, I had to learn his plan. I had to learn about demons and how to help people who have struggled with it. He started uh, bringing people who could hear from him, had prophetic ministries. I had to train them up and help them to do that. And I had to pray through the community, which I was there. Uh, one day uh, or one evening, he woke me up and said, I want you to go around seven times around the Salvation Army officers' manse where they lived. Okay. Here we are, three o'clock in the morning. I had my uh, Ugg boots on. Yeah. I was praying hard, please don't let a dog wake me up or wake them up. But you see, the Salvation Army officer had really health struggles, okay. really, really problems. And so I had to be faithful and true and say, Lord, if you want me to do that, I know it sounds crazy, but I'll do it. At 3 a.m. in the 3 morning? 3 a.m. in the morning, okay. praying hard that no dog is going to bark and walking around and hopefully through that, like, the, like uh, Joshua did at the walls of Jericho, that the walls around this guy's life will fall down and something good will happen to him. Okay, well, we're going to come back after the break to find out if something did happen from what seems like a really weird situation to be in. <laughs> walking around, <laughs> building seven times. But we will come back with more of Life Burst straight after this with Matt and Sarah. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We're chatting to John. And John, you've uh, 
have been feeling and sensing these invitations mm. from God, and you're at the point where even as a, a minister, you're being asked, or you feel like you're being asked by God to do some very strange things. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you're walking around uh, the Salvation Army uh, at, in the middle of the night. Seven times. Seven times, yeah. uh, as instructed. Uh, what happened what from happened? there? Well, it was very interesting is that, and it's a sad story, is that he he continued to struggle. He needed help and prayer but didn't take up the invitation. Okay. And so he he was a truckie and he smoked. And if you're a Salvation Army and you smoke, you're not allowed to be in the Corps. And his, his, his wife was really more of a core person than that. So the marriage actually separated. And he, in the end, took his own life which is, you know, a sad outcome. Mm. Mm. But it could have been better. But uh, God invites, but he lets us to answer the invitation the way that we want to. So did that shake you? Did that uh, cause you to go back and question? No, I, I, I've, I've learned that over the years that um, people have their own choices mm. to make. And that's important to them and it's important to God. He doesn't force anything. Mm. So what happened was that it was nine years at Peterborough. The kids loved it. My wife hated it. And for the, I knew that I had to be there because it was a training ground for me. I did a lot of ministry, a lot of work, understanding everything like that. And so my whole thesis I was writing was changing from growing small churches, which I was doing quite effectively, mm -hmm. to now the healing ministry of Jesus mm -hmm. and putting a framework in uh, to understand that. So the last four years was a real tension between my wife who wanted to go to Adelaide and I believe God wanted me to stay there. And uh, it was difficult for her. The bonus for her was that God was close to her and uh, she actually was given the gift of speaking in tongues during that time. But uh, at the beginning of my, the ninth year, she said, if, you don't, if we don't leave, I'm leaving you, which is pretty tough, but mm. I understood that. So I prayed about it, and the Lord says, no, it's okay, you are leaving, and I'm going to take you to Tusmore Park, United Church. Right, back in Adelaide. Back, back in, in Adelaide. Adelaide. Well, I said, that's great. So I signed up and everything like that, and I waited for it to happen. Well, what happened was that they asked someone different. <laughs> they didn't ask me. And, you know, each month went by, and I was waiting for this invitation. And I said, did I hear right? Am I getting it right? Anyway, they invited another guy. And part of the reason was they get my application and they read through what I was involved with, with healing and everything. I went straight to the bottom of the list. Right. Ah. Bit too weird. No, too weird. Too weird. Mm -hmm. so, Even though that's what you're saying that Jesus was yeah. doing. Yeah. So what happened was that in the end, uh, the, the guy who said yes then said no. He wanted to stay one more year where he was. And so in the end, they invited me to okay. Tasmore Park. And... Uh, so that was an end, another change of dynamic because all of a sudden God started sending me people with really complex health issues okay. and I had to work out what I was doing. At the same time, um, I was growing a church and we grew a second service and we had people coming back from the life of the church. It was a more modern service and we worked out how to do a, a worship time that enabled the Holy Spirit to visit and, to be, and people to encounter him. Mm -hmm. And that was an exciting time. And at the same time, with all these people coming, God brought people to help me. So we started uh, Pools of Healing. And I had about 10 people on the, on the list I trained up. And Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, they were there in my hall praying for people who signed up who so wanted help in that way. And so I really blossomed and grew in that way, which was really exciting for uh, eight years. It was Good. The worst part is in the third year, in 1998, uh, our, wall, our own life was torn apart because my wife contracted cancer. So she had a uterine cancer that went into the bloodstream, became a lung cancer, then she had a brain tumour. So for 12 months, we're fighting for her life. Mm. And... It's a bit strange because here I'm supposed to be the guru of healing. Yes, that's right. You're supposed to I'm know supposed it to know and doing it, do it, it for other people, but it, by the sounds of it, it wasn't working. No, for it was wife. not. It was ironic. But God was providing. He provided a gynecologist because there's, there weren't many openings in the gynecologist. Mm -hmm. So he gave us a guy who was very good, but he was being sued for malpractice. Huh. 
but he had, he had experienced cancer with his child, and so he knew and identified that. Yeah. We went to a couple of people who were supposed to have the gift of healing, so we went forward. Um, but a lady who we knew in the congregation came up to Liz and, and, and said, God said to me, you've got to forgive the doctor who, missed, who didn't diagnose you. So that was the first step of the healing was to diagnose. So every after that, she forgave the doctor, wrote a letter, a lady a Christian doctor, and then uh, we started praying for every Sunday, every as much as we can. And everything was going well, but nothing was happening. Did all the things that you're supposed to do. I'm supposed to be the guru. But God has his own sense of humour. Catholic lady. Catholic lady. You know, nothing happens in the Catholic Church, but a Catholic lady came, and there's a lot does happen in the Catholic Church. This lady came uh, after church, and we knew her, but she doesn't come regularly, came, laid hands upon her chest, and Liz felt the power of God go through her, and all the lung cancer started to disappear. Amazing. Mm. How did she know it was disappearing? Well, because you see, you got you go to the doctor, don't you? And you go to the doctor, and they do tests, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, that which is all spotty has now disappeared. Wow! Mm. Wow! Miracle. It was a, 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 along with the chemo and everything God used to do all of that. But then the brain tumor really rocked her socks, mm. and she really tossed it in for a few, three days. She gave up on God. But that was. We, she worked it through and then decided that it was okay. And God gave her a, a picture. She was sitting there in our house and she saw the rainbow on her leg through the glass. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the thought that came to her was uh, that she was healed of cancer. In the same way that there was no more flood with the story of Noah and the rainbow coming, so oh, okay. she felt there was no more cancer. And that's been true 26 years later. Mm -hmm. she, oh, has not, awesome. she has not uh, had any Skerrick of cancer, which is ama amazing, really. It is, yeah, because a lot of the time that does not happen. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, again, uh, a time of wrestling for you, with you both, as you yes. as you knew the, the stuff, you'd experienced lots of uh, incredible things. Lots uh, of healing with other people, but then not me, but somebody else mm. for my wife, and that was exciting. And we always believe that God uses uh, the medical profession, professionals, mm. as well as mm -hmm. uh, prayer to yeah. do that. It's a, it's a combination. It's not uh, one size fits all. Everyone is different. So God has a health plan for all of us, um, but we have to stick to his health plan. And sometimes it will be prayer that will be involved, but not necessarily there will be medication, doctors as well, psychologists, psychiatrists, the whole works are used by God to do that. So I, I've learned that we do our bit with God and they do their bit and together we can get healing in that way. Mm. So it's like you have to listen and follow God to know what to do. Yeah. Which from what you're saying sounds pretty unique within a church because, yeah. Well, the, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was except the church didn't like it. They, they didn't oh. want my healing being taken, their church time taken up with all the healing I've been doing. But isn't that the whole point of Jesus' ministry? Like I thought so. I to thought do so. That? But remember that not everyone believes in supernatural healing. Not everyone believes even in churches that. And churches have their own agendas and their own desires. Hmm. And so it would, became would, obvious that... Would, it, would have you believed it until you saw it? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, yeah. No. I, I, well, it goes back to Peter Bale when I saw God mm. doing there. And then, then we had these complex issues. And see, what happened was that God said to me, you've got to develop a program. So I developed a prayer ministry process and I trained people in it. So it wasn't dependent upon me, but we could do a teamwork and we follow the process and work with Jesus and things will be better with it all. And so I trained people up. We, we mm. formed pools of healing and we had uh, about 10 on the team and people came and some people could hear from God better than others. Some people knew the process and together as a team, they prayed through all the, all the areas that need to be done. And it was really quite exciting times. The sad thing is the church... The church could have had it and it could have been an amazing ministry, but they didn't want it. Mm. So mm. it was time to move on. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be back with more of John's story straight after this here on Life Births with Matt and Sarah. <laughs> Welcome back to Life Births here with Matt and Sarah. Today we are chatting with John and it's very interesting. Everyone's story is interesting, but this one in particular, 
you were working with a church for a church and you're doing healing ministry and the church didn't really like that. So what did you, did you go out on your own? Did you keep doing it or did you just stop doing it? Well, again, uh, God invites us. So the invitation came out of the blue to go to Queensland to, um, Rangeville Uniting Church Mm -hmm. uh, and Freedom Life Centre. Okay. But very quickly, Rangeville Uniting Church, I arrived in the February. They left the Uniting Church for various issues. Yeah. And Freedom Life left. And then with Freedom Life, we had issues with the previous uh, person who was looking after it and there were some issues there. Yeah. And so we had some tension there. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, I ran three conferences where the presence of God was so powerful that people uh, were just transformed by all sorts of things. We ha- we learned about banner waving and people uh, walking through and the presence of God was so powerful, they virtually had to crawl through because the presence of God was so strong. But what happened at the end of the third year was that um, they didn't want me mm. for various reasons. So then I thought we would have to go back uh, to Adelaide with my tails between my legs and and then we went to Coolum for two weeks. The first week was a lot of tears because mm. we gave up a lot to leave our kids and everything. Yeah. And so um, then the second week, God started to talk to me. He says, you're not going back. Uh, we're going to f- you're going to form your healing ministry and I'm going to help you. And so what happened was we formed Walking Free. We found um, sponsorship to make it a half-time ministry. So we looked at the people who would give money. We applied to the ATO and over two goes, we were able to get uh, tax adaptability for what we're doing. And so all of a sudden people were ringing up, we're doing phone ministries, we're doing uh, ministries face-to-face, we were going around places, all of that sort of thing. And so again, people with a whole range of needs started to come to our doorstep. And we developed a prayer process, and uh, which I took from uh, Adelaide to there, and began to see what God was going to do in that way. And then we were there for six years in Toowoomba, uh, three years at the church, then three years I was part-time and helping people. Then we went to four years at um, Coolangatta. And we had, we had amazing, uh, uh, amazing stories. We got rung up, are you the Ghostbuster? Mm. <laughs> and we were no. invited. <laughs> Well, I was interviewed on the, on the local radio about a guy who had things going bump in the night. These are not Christian people. So he invited us to come down. He and his wife had come back from Bali and brought a whole lot of stuff back from Bali. But okay. what he brought back was all the spirits that, uh, that were there. So his lights were going on and off. Uh, things were going bump in the night. And so he, he called us to come and to pray through his house. Oh, wow. And That's so uh, we, we did. And um, and. And what happened was that uh, afterwards, um, nothing was there. It was all gone. We dealt with what the problems were. And uh, he was just amazed that these are not Christians. These are people who heard about me and to do that. So so we had all these experiences. We we went to Woodenbong to, um, to a, a cattle property, which had lost cattle, pasture going, and we prayed through that. We discovered that there was a lot of problems in the early parts with Aboriginal people fighting each other, killing each other, and that impacted and affected the land, defiled the land. Oh. And so we prayed through all of that. Mm-hmm. We had to pray through a guy who hung himself in the uh, in one of the sheds there and had to deal with all of that. And so we cleaned up, spiritually cleaned up that whole place, that property. And 12 months later, um, we got a phone call from two brothers who were, owned the property. Mm-hmm. Pastures were back green as anything. Yeah. And cattle were producing calves two or three times. So the whole business just was turned around all because we because... prayed through the whole property and got rid of all the problems that were on the property. All because it allowed Jesus to be on the property yeah. and to be there in the land. All of the the problems... He the cleaned darkness, up. It, it just went yeah. because Jesus. And he does that. He does that with people's lives too. All the problems of their people's lives, he can clean it up. And it's not hard for him, uh, but we have to be willing to, to do that. In that that sense. invitation that you yeah. keep talking about. He always that. invites us to come to do that. So I hear a lot of people might say that they are, they're spiritual and they're, they're open to that, but they're not religious. Uh, but what you're, you're saying, and I know you've only skimmed the surface of your story is that, uh, that even as a, a, a minister in, a, in an organised church, you've seen 
spiritual things happen and and real and powerful things happen that have actually yeah. transformed not just people but communities and properties, and properties churches we've had to pray through churches because they weren't weren't functioning very well so we we pray for same sort of principles praying for a person's life and dealing with their rubbish deals with a property uh, whether it be a church building or another we've invited the businesses all of those things so Lo and behold, this just opened up like Pandora's mm, box mm. and everything. But the same principles that we applied in dealing with the problems and, and getting the people to say sorry to God and saying for the problems, God says, good, you heard, I, I hear what you're saying. I'll clean up your life. I'll clean up your property. I'll clean up your business for you. And even if you are not a committed ticket-holding Christian going to church, it doesn't matter with God. If you're really serious about wanting a thing cleaned up, he's more than happy to do that. And that's what happened as well. So Walking Free was started in 2007 and uh, that was really cool. Uh, but then we came back to Adelaide uh, and uh, st continued that in 2019. Uh, I finished as a minister. Walking Free finished uh, last year. And then he says, okay, now I want you to write a book. Okay to write up all that you've learned, everything that you do to do that. I says, okay, I can do that. And so then I said, well, it's all ready to write a book, but I really need to get to America to publish it because that's where all the crazies are. That's where everything happens over there, <laughs> sure. okay. all over there. Right. So what happened was that uh, last Christmas, um, I, I went on to uh, bookproposals.com, paid $150 to, to get on there. And with my uh, book process, because I'd written the whole book beforehand, and get onto it, and then lo and behold, two days later, Advantage Books from uh, Florida, a Christian organisation, said, we like your book, we want to publish it. So now I'm in the process of uh, writing it, getting it published, going through all the rewrites and everything like that, so that, that all that I've learned is out there for people to be able to get hold of. That's right. And when it's available, we'll chuck it in the comments of the video. Well, it we'll hopes to be out by end of July, August. So we're yeah. getting there. The process is getting there. And it'll be quite exciting in that sense. And uh, But, you know, it costs, it's an investment. It's going to cost me about 7000 Australian dollars with all the things. It'll go out as a book and an e-book. And even when it's sold, uh, then I only get a small amount back. So it's a really a step of faith of getting my money back. But it really doesn't matter. It's an investment to the column. So that's really exciting. But you see, there's more. And I haven't told you about mm -hmm. this. But you see, what happens is not only did God invite me to write a book, previously he invited me to go to India and Kenya to pray for people, to teach people. And again, it's the same process. God, you know, God is working everywhere. He wants an intimate relationship with you, but he, wants, he invites you to join him. But there's a step of faith that's got to be faith. It's a crisis of belief. Is he calling me? Is he uh, doing that? And are you willing to be obedient to what he says? So I get all these emails from people overseas, blah, blah, and so oh, you, you pop them off. And all of a sudden, God says, no, I want you to go there. So we've helped two brothers. We've, we've funded two churches in India. And now with, the, with the, my previous church, we also funded a church in Kenya. And so it's been amazing to have that relationship and going over there, training pastors, praying for people, seeing God move and act in mighty ways. It's a, it's an amazing thing. I'll tell you one story was was it all? We had a lady who was about seventy. She had a really bad back, and she was really bent over. And so uh, we came to this meeting and said, well, "You know, can I pray for you?" And she said, "Yes." So I prayed for her, and I prayed for her back. And nothing really seemed to happen. I said, "Can you do something that you could never do before?" Here is a seventy-year-old. Blow me down. She did forward roll in front of me. What even? <laughs> I said, what are you doing? And then and then we were, we were running another meeting and this guy was woken up by God and to come to the meeting. He was sitting in the back of the church and uh, we had a monsoon and a lot of people couldn't come. And so, uh, so uh, uh, he was sitting there and uh, what happened was that uh, I was just talking as I normally do and everything like that. And, uh, and so I said, he put up his hand. And he says, because we asked for testimonies and things, I put up, oh, yeah. yes, well, God woke me up. I didn't receive an invitation to this meeting, but I came because God told me to come. And as I'm sitting there, he healed my back and I'm free. Wow. Incredible. 
Wow. Amazing. That's fantastic. Okay. Well, John, you've shared so many stories so and I'm much. sure as you were when you were younger, it's raising a lot of questions in, yeah. in those who are listening and watching. But uh, thank you for uh, just sharing us a glimpse yeah. into this world that you've uh, stepped into and uh, full of surprises and invitations as well. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank, thank you. For the invite. Thank you. You can catch up with Life Bursts wherever you get your podcasts from on community television, radio, and of course, all over social media. This has been Life Bursts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. Thank you again for joining us. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a Raw Cut production.